For those of you who don't know me, I'm Werner Hofstetter. I'm with uh, Woodworks BC. I do a myriad of things we can get into if you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, but basically we're here to promote wood everywhere. We're so glad you're here uh, to help out. Gives me great pleasure right now to introduce uh, Liam Dewar. Uh, he's the director of Urban Limited. Uh, he's a founding director, and it's a consultancy construction company specializing in the design and delivery specifically of cross-laminated timber structures. Uh, he's born in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, and Liam is also a registered architect, having previously worked in the offices of Herzog and de Moron in Basel, Switzerland, and engineers Consett Bronzini Gartman in Chur, Switzerland. Urban is credited with introducing solid timber construction into the UK through collaboration, integrity, and a desire to improve building design and performance. So without further ado, uh, here's Liam Dewar. Um, thank you, and also it's my first time in North America, so thank you for the nice weather. It makes me feel at home. <laughs> um, when I arrived um, you know, from my flight, I got the, that sky train into, into Vancouver, and the first thing I saw was um, some logs floating around. And it did make me think, well, you've obviously got a lot of timber. Um, it's just the buildings that really need to be addressed. Um, now, there is a question in terms of, from an architect's perspective, and I am an architect, so there is a question as to why you would use timber. Because to be fair, you know, materials are materials, and, and concrete's a nice material potentially as well. Um, and most people will sell materials, so you know, there's also very good reasons why you might use a material, um, not necessarily these ones, but um, I'm sure it's quite healthy as a building material. The compelling argument, however, is that if you don't use some materials, you'll be doing a benefit. And for anyone who's involved in um, having an effect, and that's architects particularly if they're building buildings, mitigating that effect is a positive thing. So um, that's a reason in itself not to use some materials and the fact that they have quite a large impact and therefore one doesn't use them. Um, equally important is the fact that if one does use timber, so if one makes a positive choice, um, then one can also have an effect of the storing of the carbon in the timber. So one has this double benefit from using timber, one that one's using it and secondly that one's not using something else. And let's be realistic, timber, as in not the old growth stuff, but the stuff, the majority of the stuff, and certainly the stuff that we use in our buildings, is, is a crop. So it's grown for use. Um, it will, after 80, 100 years, be harvested. And you then have a choice. Um, you're either going to use it um, in your fire, so you're going to burn it, which is fine, gives you energy, um, or you're going to build it into buildings. And there's obviously various things you can do in between those two things. Um, if you burn it, the CO2 goes straight back into the atmosphere. If you build it, you can store, store the CO, um, CO2 in, in the form of carbon for an, an extra 80, 100 years. So you can double the storage um, that you got from growing the tree simply by using it for construction. So if you just think of it that way, that's why you build with timber, because it's the best thing to do with that crop. Um, and that's the dull cycle. Now, I'm just going to that was my brief introduction to timber, and that's, that's why I do timber. And now I'm going to talk about what, what we do with this stuff. Um, but hopefully you can kind of follow that argument. Um, and I would just say timber isn't always the most suitable material, so I'm quite pragmatic about this, and if it doesn't work in timber, then there's no problem doing it in something else. So generally speaking, anything that's underground, um, concrete's probably the most appropriate material. Everything that's overground, probably timber. Now, in order to get an understanding why the, the, the cross slam material exists, one has to sort of perhaps go back a step and just say, well, how, you know, how long have we been using solid timber as, as a building material? Um, well, for quite a long time, um, and in, let's say in Central Europe, you know, um, this building in itself is probably not that old, but um, certainly this type of building, Schlickbau, which is knitted construction, so the corners are knitted together, um, has been around for hundreds of years, um, and also quite high, as you can tell from that previous slide. Um, and this construction method is still used in Central Europe, and particularly in places like Switzerland today. Um, Fantastic buildings, um, however, there's a certain number of criteria you have to be aware of. Um, the first is that you need a lot of experience to build in this because you get a lot of settlement from lots of horizontal timbers that, that are stacked on top of each other. Um, the second thing is you need to have very good quality timber, otherwise you get a lot of movement. And the third thing is you need, to need a lot of time um, because this is slow building. Um, time, good quality timber, um, basically means cost. So this is expensive. Um, some countries can afford it, um, other countries can't. Um, but in generally speaking, if we're just talking about delivering buildings for, for the majority of people, that is unaffordable. Um, and hence, one developed away from that to something that perhaps is more affordable. The next development was Brechtstapel. So this was using smaller sectional timbers, easier to get come by, so larger resource, um, and just doweling or nailing them together, just creating larger bits. So um, raw material, small boards, 
and processed in a very low-key and um, cottage industry type way, um, adding value to a local carpenter in terms of what they deliver. And these are sort of, say, half fabricated, so 600 to a metre wide um, in sort of generally used for floors, but also can be used for walls. Um, so it sounds all very good. Why aren't we doing this? Well, there's two problems with this insofar as, uh, let's say, the UK is concerned. I, would, I will add in Canada for that as well. Um, the first is that if you're going to use this sort of material, you have to be very mindful that it moves. And when I mean move, that's when it gets wet. And as it invariably does rain, um, you're going to get, for, for a metre-wide panel, which is... Um, Sorry, my, my feet and inches are rubbish when it comes, but anyway, I'll just say metres and hopefully you can convert. So a metre-wide panel, you're going to get a centimetre um, movement. So once you run a, a number of these panels together, you can see how your wall suddenly leans out when you get some rain on it. So that's the first critical issue. The second one is the fact that by having lots of linear things that are just dialed together, if you put a force there, they all start racking against each other, they all start moving. So in order to overcome that, you have to start putting a board on the outside. So that's another trade, that's another cost. And also, one of the main reasons why people build in this way is because there's no adhesive in the product. Well, if you put a board on the outside, then you've got adhesive in the system. So the benefit that you were hoping to achieve is suddenly gone. Introducing the cross-laminated timber. So this has overcome the primary concern, which is it needs to be foolproof. We cannot, for a country that perhaps hasn't got the knowledge of the 350 years of, of building with solid timber, have a product that requires huge amounts of knowledge, because otherwise you have huge risk associated with it. So what one's looking for is a low-risk material that does the same thing, which is introduce a lot of timber into building. And basically, this involves the same raw material, so the small bores coming from the small trees, uh, finger-jointed together into continuous lengths, the width and the breadth of the master panel, um, which is fabricated, and these are cross-laminated into however many layers you want. So the first thing to understand about this is this is bespoke. This is made to order. It's not a, a product that you can take off the shelf. So, so anything that kind of like plywood panel, though it's a giant plywood panel, it's a very different animal because you need to order it specific for your project. So it's a project-specific material. That's the raw material. That's it getting turned into these continuous lengths. That's the big flat bed. Um, some of them have a vacuum press to make curved panels and also to be more environmental. Most of them, most of the manufacturers, have a big weight that goes on top to put the pressure on. What's it being adhesive bonded? So this is a vacuum here. Um, and then what you get out of here is like a giant piece of cardboard. So it's, it's your, your master panel, which you then cut down into the pieces that you want in order to make your little cardboard model, albeit we're building one-to-one. -one. So that panel is, let's say, 5 metres by 15 metres. And to be fair, it's not going very far, because what determines the size of the panel is delivering it to site. Kind of obvious. Um, and if you're like we are in the UK and we don't have any production capacity, we, our capabilities, we don't have the ability to, to lift heavy panels and, and secondary process, then we get all the processing done in the factory. So the factory is not just a, a manufacturer of a material, it's also a processor of material. So what you end up with is you know, a flat pack building. So it is very simple and that's part of the, the, the nice thing about it. It's meant to be simple. Um, so it kinda, you, get what you, you get what you expect in a sense. And you get an entire wall panel, which might be a wall, and you get an entire floor or roof panel, and you, know, you need a number of these to create your building. I'm going quite quickly because I've got a lot of slides to go through, so hopefully you'll, you'll stay with me. So what are the advantages? Why would you want so much timber in your building anyway? Okay, aside from the fact that it's a good thing to use timber, it's a good thing to use for timber in construction. Well, um, even back, and this is you know, just looking at what's available on this side of the water, um, you know, back in 1970, here's a guy who's building in solid timber. Now, he doesn't have CLT panels or cross-line panels, so he's having to make, make do with the 2x4s that he's got. And this is how it's been described. So it's a building that's made entirely out of 2x4s, um, kind of good corners, and consequently it's fantastic within uh, earthquake and cyclone zones. Well, brilliant, because this is exactly what we want from our buildings, firstly, and um, particularly when we're building here. Um, and not only that, but we've now actually demonstrated that this works because this is the, the shaker table, the largest in the world, in Japan, and they've got a building, seven storey on it. They've given it a good shake, Kyobi, 7.6 Richter scale, and um, the consequences of the shake means a little bit in the fixings. And of course, they learn from this. That means this is you know, about as bad as it gets. So the big worry in terms of solid timber buildings in an earthquake isn't the building, it's the people inside, yeah? protecting people from kind of knocking around. The second part, and again back to the 1970s, um, was that once you start building with lots of timber, um, in effect you have a very um, fireproof structure because the timber burns and protects by burning, um, but also you get the, the, the stability, you get the thermal stability, you get the moisture stability. Um, so you, know, you get a warm building when you want the warm building, you get a, 
um, keep up the heat out um, when you want a cool building. Um, and often this is confused in terms of thermal mass because an industry that's supporting concrete will generally say, yeah, but you want thermal mass. And timber is rubbish in thermal mass and concrete is really good. But you've got to take a step back from that because, of course, everyone wants to sell the material and hence they'll always say what, what looks favourable. If we're simply looking at thermal mass and if we don't have any allegiances, then you've only got air on one side and you've got water on the other side. And the best thing to do for thermal mass is water. So if you've got heat loads that you're trying to take out, you've got an office building, there's too many computers, well, take the computers out of the room, that's the first thing. But if, if you've still got the heat load, then um, you just put some water. You get some capillary tubes, pump some water through it, take the heat out that way. You don't need your structure to perform that role. What you do need your structure to perform, though, is the stability function, because you need an environment that people are comfortable in. And that's about stability. That's not about thermal mass. And what you can see there, again, is, well, actually, your water is kind of your, your best thing, so um, take a bath. But um, you know, if you're not going to do that, if you want a room that you can kind of habitate, then solid timber is your preferred choice of material to deliver thermal stability, um, and that means comfort and health. Um, and there's your little comfort and health diagram, and that's just showing what the timber does all on its own without you doing anything. So the more timber, the more of this performance you can get. And really, it's just like buying a car. Yeah? So the people can afford it, can afford more timber. The people that can't, they can't. That's kind of how you need to look at it. If you can afford it, you have it. So it's not just structure. I think this is a really important thing. This is anything I'm going to say. It's not structure. Well, it has to stand up. We're not expecting buildings to fall down. So that's a kind of minimum from an architectural perspective, is that the building stands up. But we actually want the building to perform, and, and that's where the timber comes into its own. So it's a holistic um, material, an all-rounder, if you want to call it that. But this thermal performance, of course, is great when you're building, because it means that it can take whatever temperatures and you, know, you throw at it in whatever conditions. Again, great for this kind of environment, and also good um, when we get this kind of weather in the UK. Um, and water, which is normally a real issue for timber, um, as I described for the panels that kind of expand, and, and anything that's small will do the same. Um, you know, because you have the cross-lamination, it's only the top surface that gets wet, um, which is fine. You know, it does go beyond the 20% moisture content, but if it dries out, it's not a problem. What it doesn't do is go all the way into the panel. So the panel remains dry, the surface gets wet, but the, the, fact, the important aspect is because it's dry, it's stable. And that's the, you know, it means that you can build large flat areas without the risk of, of the whole <laughs> building deforming. Um, by having large panels um, that are very simple, you have very simple connections. And connections is usually where the risk is or where the problem is. So, you know, keeping that, that down actually just simplifies matters and reduces the risk. So large coke bolt screws. And, of course, large panels also means less connections, um, which, again, is simple and um, means faster building. Um, in terms of airtightness, um, quite an important aspect. The panel itself is airtight. So um, in order to achieve overall building airtightness, it's a matter of taking the joints. Um, so, again, very simple. Um, detailing at the base, well, angle brackets, you need something to fix it to the ground. Um, it's heavy enough to stay there, so you don't have huge uplifts but, um, for the standard building, but you know, anchor bolts into the concrete and nails into the, the panel, and, and, and you, that's your fix into the ground. Uh, if you've got an issue with water on the ground, well, you know, just like you do with concrete, get some blackjack, paint it on, put a membrane over the top, and you've dealt with your water. Um, if you've got windows to install, well, factory cut openings all in the drawings, the same drawings used to size your windows. Um, windows arrive at roughly the same time, put into the opening or put on the outside of the opening again. And um, hard to get that bit wrong. Servicing, um, always got somewhere to fix to, it's dry, it's easy to fix. Um, you know, they're much faster, they're much happier. And happier is important, you know, because in the end of the day, there's nothing worse than drilling into concrete. Um, so, you know, great. Um, and of course, coordinated. And for what, you know, some services will have to be on the outside, some can be routed in. And there is options here. But again, the important thing and the simplicity of it all. Sorry. Um, and then when it comes to kind of just saying, well, you know, how do I then, what, what else do I need to do? Um, you've got your structure. You can line it if you want. You can also leave it exposed. You've got the outside. You might some, add some insulation. You've got the stability. You then insulate the stability. In other words, it doesn't cool out too much to the wrong side. Um, you add some cladding. This allows you to build an all-timber construction if you want. So you've got your structure, you've got the wood fibre insulation, you've got some battens, and you've got some timber cladding. Great. Um, and that's an example of the exposed finish on the inside. As I say, no reason why you can't do this. Slightly higher grade of timber, but saves you in terms of finishing costs. So what do you need to be aware of then? This is, sounds like a fantastic material everyone wants to use. Um, there must be some sort of catch. Um, the main limiter in is, is as I said before, the size. You've, you've got to be able to deliver this to site. Um, and that's why you, the first consideration is, you know, does this work for my project? You know, can I actually deliver these large panels? Because if I end up delivering lots of small bits, manhandling them all, then it's not really going to be the right material for me. Um, you know, some people overcome this. You know, this, is, this isn't 
Britain, this is Central Europe, but you know, you can come up with ways of delivering to very inaccessible areas if that's what you particularly want to do. Um, equally, you can use a different system. Um, the other thing in the need is the crane. Um, to say, I mean, we have delivered projects without cranes, but you know, let's be realistic. The majority of projects, if you're going to lift a, a ton to three tons, or you want to keep the panels as large as you can, that's their weight, um, you're going to need either a mobile crane or a self-erecting crane. So these are sort of the, you know, the kind of start as to why it might work. And, and a certain scale of projects, perhaps the other one that... Um, sorry, I've got the headache. <coughs> you need that, that scale of project to, make, to fill up the lorry, although we're going to show you a project that, that's got hardly any panels on it, just to say it still somehow works even when you don't. Um, Britain is kind of the world's leader in health and safety, which is good and bad. It's, it's good in terms of keeping you know, people alive. It's, it's bad in terms of all the paperwork you have to fill in. Um, so this isn't you know, a scenario that we particularly want. Um, but um, you know, with good management, you should be able to address that. In terms of urban, um, you know, why do we exist? Okay, we've got a fantastic systems, really simple. You don't need someone like urban. I mean, that's fair enough. Um, you know, there is a reason, though, and, and the reason is because we fill a gap. And we fill the gap between the design team who want to use material and the manufacturer who wants to supply the material because they need to somehow be able to speak to each other. Um, and, and having filled that gap, we've now ended up delivering some quite large structures and because it's actually is a, it's, it's an important role to have. So you've got your design, you've got your finished building, and you, you need somebody just to do that bit in between. So what we basically do very simply is we do some designing, so that's some, you know, typically engineering, typical engineering. We do some drawing, we need to produce the stuff that the factory can use in order to produce its panels, and we do some building, we put them together. So that's, you know, that's what we do. To go into a bit more detail, um, we have three areas. We have the timber design, we've got the material supply, we've got the installation. And we try and keep them together. Because once you start using off-site fabrication processes, you've got design off-site as much as design in the office. And that's why these two people need to speak to each other. And once you start breaking something down into manageable components and trying to put them together again, it's really helpful if you were the person that broke it down and to put it together. Always have to teach someone else what you've done, which means you might as well do it yourself. What we mainly do, um, so that's, that's kind of the process of delivering buildings, but you know, the first thing we probably do is costing, you know, because it's not an unfair question to ask is how much does it cost, you know. I mean, a client's only got so much money. Um, what becomes difficult is when they don't actually know how much it should cost or they don't know how much money they want to spend. But, you know, let's just assume that somebody does know how much they want to spend and then, you know, um, it's reasonable for them to ask, you know, is this affordable? Um, the answer is always yes, by the way, um, because building in this construction method is not a cost decision um, because it's just a matter of how you decide to distribute your money. And what you need to know is how much money you have and where you want to put your money. Um, of course, if by getting involved in design early, you can work to a budget. And working to a budget does mean there's an element of value engineering that might take place in order to make the project, the aspirations, actually meet the budget that someone has. Um, this is not achieved through tendering. Um, tendering is an absolute waste of time, in case anyone wants to know. It does not work. It simply it can't work. You've got five people doing the same job. How is that going to be cost effective? The next aspect is the, fact, is the non-engineering side, which is the, is the overall performance, because most people say, aren't interested in, in structure only um, because they expect the building to stand up, so they want to know about acoustics, they want to know about thermal, um, and, and the, this is the other aspect which, which we help on, which is kind of an important part of, of delivering structures. Um, and the final bit, of course, is the information that's involved in getting the material made to a certain drawing, and that involves logistics in terms of which materials are which lorry and when are they arriving. And then for our guys on site, we need to give them drawings. So this isn't, you know, drawings just for, you know, the, the process of approval. This is drawings that actually help somebody put something together. So, so we produce those as well. Material supply. Now, in Central Europe, there's no shortage of people who make this panel. So there's 15, let's say, manufacturers. And they all have slightly different capabilities, and the products are always slightly different. So um, being independent from manufacturers, we just say, well, OK, this is what you're trying to do, and these are the people that are best placed to do it. Um, we don't go through a tendering process with them unless we're asked to, because we know how much the material costs. It's, it's, it, you know, people, people charge a certain amount for what they need to do, and, and you either buy it or you don't. It's very simple. Um, what we don't have in the UK is that many trees. We've got some, but not enough for the number of people we have. Um, whereas other countries have a lot of trees, such as British Columbia. So, you know, we, we basically go to countries that have trees and we say, can we have some of your trees, please? <coughs> um, and then we bring the trees to the people and build their buildings. And, and that basically means for us, 
Um, you know, we're getting them from Switzerland, from Austria, and from, from southern Germany. Um, there's also trees in Scandinavia, but they don't have many people there. And that's why um, the Scandinavians tend to focus on other timber products, whereas the panel products are, are centrally located in order to kind of serve the, the larger population. Installation. We have our own installers, um, and the reason for this is because we want reliability. I mean, you know, somebody not showing up is very expensive for us. We have a lorry showing up, we have a crane on site, you know, it costs us a lot of money if it doesn't happen. We're trying to be on site for the shortest period of time, and that's, that's, that's how it works for us. Um, so, you know, we need to get it done quickly. The other aspect is we want to build quality buildings. We don't want the situation where we've done all the hard work only to find that the building is a mess. So, you know, by having our own people, we actually are able to deliver what we say we're going to deliver, which is important for our clients, because a lot of them do rely on trust. Um, you know, they just expect us to deliver, and we do. Um, health and safety, um, as I say, is quite a, a key element to what we do in the UK, just because of the regulations that are there. It's not a bad thing, and um, it just means there's a lot of um, training that needs to be done, a lot of, um, you know, these are, these are highly trained people, is what I'm saying. Um, and one has to consider that, you know, these sort of people, as in people on site, tend to earn about half as what a consultant earns. You know, and yet the conditions are twice as bad, um, and you know, they're equally well trained as we are, albeit in a different area. So you know, I'm quite for the idea that one has to work together, and one shouldn't sort of pretend that there's the people that build and there's the people that design and the kind of different people. Um, you know, we're, we're one and the same because that's what a building is. And then if you've got exposed finishes, quite a lot of projects do, then of course you also want to ensure that that's protected. So, and it's, it's not actually the rain that's such an issue, it's the sun. Because when you have a lot of sun on a spruce board or, or whatever, you know, light timber, then it will discolour. And the sun will only shine in certain directions, and therefore you get some areas that are dark and other areas that aren't. So, um, you know, as part of that, you know, there is good value in protecting. So to the UK, to, to, my, to my topic. Um, we, we started as a company in 2003, so, so take a little step back, 1995. Um, Historically in Britain, there has been, certainly in Scotland, there's been quite a lot of timber frame. Most of the buildings are timber frame, and most of the housing, um, but not in England. Um, in, in about 80s, mid 80s, there was a World of Action program, television program that said timber buildings rot. Um, and overnight, basically, um, timber, the industry was dead. Um, and it's taken a long time. And part of that sort of rebuilding confidence program was um, building the six story building in timber frame and doing lots of tests on it. So, so that was done, and that basically allowed people to have a certain sort of confidence that you can build to a certain height in timber. Um, however, um, being the, the promoters of solid timber and looking and saying, well, look at them doing that, we want to do that as well. So isn't this something that we can do? Um, you know, this is exactly the situation we were in as well. And it was quite compelling. We thought, look, you know, it's great, it's simple, um, you know, four-story building. This was the largest of its type, but, you know, that's what we're aspiring to. So this was our first project. Now the architect of this project was Andrew Wall. Now you might not know who Andrew Wall is, but he's the architect behind the Stadthouse. So you know this was kind of his also his kind of you know putting the toe in the water and saying, well, I wonder if this works. Um, you know we just set up. If this was a failure, then then we close the business. Um, you know it wasn't particularly utilising the lorry. It was 50 square metres of that. It was a couple of stories in the back of another building. Um, but it got built in a day. It was one Sunday. We started. Lorry arrived. Closed the road. Built the our 50 square metres, not difficult in a day. Um, and the client and the architect, they went away for lunch and they came back and the building was there. And, and he was convinced, he said, this is brilliant, this is, you know, what, what more do I need? And, and it's important to understand the aspirations of a client because clients aren't actually that interested in building. They're not really that interested in the process. They're interested in having a nice building at the end and not being charged more than they need to be charged. And that's exactly what we were able to deliver. We said, this is how much it's going to cost and this is what we deliver. But of course, we didn't really want to focus on just doing single family houses for those people that could kind of, you know, see, see the value in it. You know, we were aspiring to much larger things. We're doing lots of pricing and we were trying to always overcome this hurdle of people saying, well, it looks really good and it seems to sort of work, but we don't want to be a guinea pig and therefore we're not doing it. Um, and then we had a breakthrough. We had one client who said, okay, um, what, you know, the timber, right? Well, um, I'm looking to develop this building. It's going to be about five stories. I could do it in concrete, I could do it in steel, I could do it in timber. What's your price? Um, we were Price comparable, uh, as far as I understand, um, but the big selling point was the fact that we were faster. And as he was borrowing money, and um, speed wasn't therefore important to him, because by you know, borrowing the money for a shorter period of time was actually cheaper for him. So this is a developer. He wasn't interested in sustainability. I mean, we were always thinking that you know, people are going to do it because they, you know, they're, they like timber and they're sustainable. It, you know, nothing, nothing to do with it. Simply, it was just more cost effective for him. Um, but it doesn't matter. 
because you know if that worked then that was great and we then started you know I say in, in, in real you know because we had now a proper project that we could actually deliver um, and you know the, the, the drawings all hand drawn in those well hand drawn um, computer drawn but 2D drawn so not 3D modelled in those days um, and, and we were learning on the job because um, this was the tallest of its kind in the world um, although you know we weren't particularly it's not particularly high you know it's just that for some reason no one was doing it and, and for some reason, sorry, I mean, the, the reason was because not many countries allowed you to do it. Um, but, you know, I'll go on to that. So, you know, we were building five stories and um, it was relatively simple. It's as you'd expect, lots of panels, short sight. Um, and, you know, going through the usual motions that, that people do when they start building out solid timber. Fix them together. And we had a lift shaft and we had a stair core and we had some steel um, to deal with the areas that the timber couldn't deal with because we had large glazed areas in some sections. Um, and because we'd never done a timber lift shaft before, um, we kind of looked at the regs and we thought, well, I wonder what we have to do here. And we thought, well, it looks like we have to do some fire lining maybe to get some fire performance um, because, you know, we've got two parts. We've got the one is the, is the um, resistance, let's say, so the stability, but the other part is the surface by the flame so you don't end up getting fire running up the surface. So we um, got some fire lining board fixed in the factory um, that's it on site. So Fermacile, if you're aware of that, it's a gypsum fibre board. Um, and we even installed the um, lifting um, or the running gear points so it was all ready for the lift manufacturer to put it in. Now, this isn't necessary, but this is the stage we were at. We didn't know, so we thought this was necessary. Now we know it's not necessary, now we just do the timber. Um, the other thing we had to do um, was be responsible for the acoustics, for the thermal, for the fire, because, um, you know, again, no one really knew other than us as to what we were doing. So therefore, we took the responsibility for that and we priced it in, um, but we didn't really have the money for it. So therefore, um, part of the strategy was we weren't going to put any fire retardant coating on the timber because we didn't have any money to put fire retardant coating on the timber. In any case, you know, it, it's not a very nice thing to do with timber because timber is a natural resource and then you suddenly put something on it that turns it into a toxic material. So, um, you know, it just didn't make sense. Um, in terms of the acoustics, we were fortunate there was a certain amount of data available in Central Europe, so we kind of looked at that and made our own judgment as to what works, what doesn't. Obviously, different regulations in terms of what we need to achieve, um, so we just, it was a judgment decision. Um, and with regard to the um, surface bed of flame, well, we just didn't do it. Um, and I find that to be a very successful way of actually getting things done, because when you don't do something, then you need someone else to do some work in order to change it. And actually what the problem is, is people don't really like necessarily doing the work. So as long as you're prepared to do more work than they are, then generally you'll kind of get it through, purely kind of on, on, through, through brute in a way. So, you know, whilst they were very unhappy about what we were doing, because this was all the offices, this was all the inhabitable rooms, all the express timber, everyone was moaning and saying this is going to, you know, a huge fire issue. In the end, um, we convinced them that it wasn't a fire issue, that they were, this was a, you know, just a mo emotive thing that they had against timber and actually it wasn't a problem and, and then they actually put it forward for an award and they got a building control award um, and, and it just shows you there was a complete sort of change where they suddenly they realised that you know, it was fine and there wasn't an issue. Um, again, perhaps fortunate because the way that building control works in, in the UK is it's based on the fact that you have essential requirements and the essential requirement is that you give the opportunity for people to escape. Um, you don't have a dictatorial requirement like you must do this, thou must shall, thou shall. So, you know, it's not religion here, it's simply, you know, judgment. So, that exposed. Um, and on the back of this building, some nice Canadian shingles. Albeit, they were treated, and um, we're not involved in this part of it, I have to say, but they were treated because they're on the boundary to another, you know, a metre from the boundary, and therefore they need to have some fire performance in case, um, in case whatever. I mean, they're never going to build on the site next door because the site next door is a graveyard. Um, which is hence why it's called Permial House, because the person who's been buried in the graveyard was the first person to, to cross-fertilise two seeds, um, and that's why it was called the Permial whatever, and don't ask me what the plants were, but um, it would have had a Latin name if it wasn't for the fact that they were cross-fertilising. Sweet something or other. Um, and in terms of project data, well, um, I don't know how costs compare in, in Canada, it doesn't matter, um, the, the overall project cost at sort of £1,500 a square metre is actually quite affordable um, for the construction cost. And it's not, not just the timber bit, but the kind of overall construction. So not the side, but the construction. And, and, and actually very fast, six weeks, which is what they wanted. Um, and just as a sort of side thing, you know, at, at this same time, it was obviously something that was happening you know, in Europe, where you know, in the countries that one could perhaps do something more, there was this project, which I like very much, which is um, Brenda Lennon Christofferson um, in Norway, in Trondheim. 
Um, and you know, it's a really nice kind of example of Scandinavian architecture where you know, they have this certain aesthetic of, of exposing a lot of the timber um, in a very simple um, way. Um, they can have softwood on the, gr on the floor, for example, which we can't do in the UK because the heels all go into the softwood, whereas there the people take the shoes off. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea of the aesthetic you know, that we can achieve. Next project. So after that little 50 square meters, Andrew Ward been um, badgering away to get somebody to build something a bit higher. Um, and eventually managed to get hold of this. Um, now, this sort of scale becomes really interesting to manufacturers. Um, and us not being a manufacturer, of course, we're, we're, we're sort of pitching for this work as well. But um, once a manufacturer decides they want to deliver a project, well, then they tend to kind of deliver it. So this was um, delivered by KLH. Um, and um, as you'd expect, it was delivered very fast um, and met all the targets and, and was a, a complete success by all accounts. Um, although I'm not quite sure I believe the, the time period sometimes the three people on site for three days or whatever per week. But, but in any case, it went up in, in pretty much the time that they say and you know, became the largest of its kind in, in, you know, in, in the world, I guess. Um, as with any project that's delivered for a developer, perhaps without the, kind of the overall control, um, you know, this has no exposed timber because you know, what this is trying to do is simply be a replacement to concrete. It's simply a cost decision. Um, so anyone who's again saying, you know, I'm not sure this is affordable, this was only on cost. This wasn't because it was timber. This is simply cost. Um, so anyway, so you never see any of the timber, and you wouldn't know it was a timber building, um, but you know, it was able to, to meet again. I think roughly that's the correct construction cost, so similar again, and whatever sustainability rating. Important bit here was it was 30% saving on time, and that was the important aspect. And also that the fact there was very little disruption, um, which given that it's in a, in a quite highly density area, is an important aspect. Now, we were still working at this time, um, doing other types of building, a lot of schoolwork going on in the UK. Um, so this is an example of not quite mid-rise, because it's three stories, but gives you an idea. This was a two-story building. However, when, when it got priced, they ended up with more money than they thought they had. So therefore, they added another floor. <laughs> so maybe that tells you something. But um, So this is our installation suite. And so you know, here we're building. It's, quite a, it's a, an arts college, so therefore it's dance, uh, music, these kind of activities, quite large spaces. Um, you know, nicely detailed and very simple. Um, the cladding is similar to the Richmond Oval, I've noticed. So it's a kind of radica polycarbonate type cladding and it's on the outside. Um, and a lot of the timber exposed on the inside. It's quite large spaces, timber exposed. You know, not just cross slab, also glue lamb because of the spans. Um, and, you know, the stairs also in, in the cross slab material. Um, and the top floor, um, once they could build the structure, they couldn't actually fit it out. Yeah, so it's not entirely <laughs> they had an, exactly another floor, but they had the space, which is still fantastic. And that other floor didn't really add much to the foundations if they compared it to a concrete option. So it didn't have any cost impact on, on what was in the ground. Um, um, very low construction cost, consequently, because of the additional floor area. Um, but that's fine. Bream Outstanding, first building of its kind to get an outstanding rating under the new kind of Bream rating system. Um, so on to Bridport. Um, so the next big building, it was kind of important, we thought, that it was a different manufacturer that was going to deliver this one because we knew it was going to be driven by manufacturer because most of the cost is in the material. Um, fortunately, we backed the right manufacturers, that was Storenzo, and, and hence we got the project. Um, what we still had to address was the fact that we had to deliver this thing in three weeks. And deliver it, I mean we had to design it, um, which is never that easy, particularly when you're small office as we are. But, um, but that's kind of the name of the game that we play in. Um, the reason it was timber, again, it wasn't really a timber building. Um, it was just there was a masonry building on the site which had to be replaced, and there was a giant sewer that ran underneath the site. Um, and that sewer, being a Victorian sewer, basically could only take so much load, um, and that meant that you, know, you either um, didn't build on it, um, or if you did build on it, you didn't increase the load. To get a number of units, um, they needed to go eight stories, so it was kind of a bit of a, a dilemma for them. Um, however, um, the timber solved it. So they had the one concrete option, they had the other timber option. Um, however, in the way that as this was a, a, um, an existing building, this existing stakeholders who were being shunted off somewhere else for a period of time, and then we would be rehoused into those buildings, so social housing, and um, there was a lot of resistance to timber. Um, they really just didn't want a timber building. Um, and so there was a huge amount of con you know, convincing done by the architects in order to say, well, timber is actually okay. Part of that was the fact that they were going to clad it all in brickwork. And they going to say, well, you don't even know it's a timber building because it's going to be brick just like the one you're in. Um, eventually, you know, they, they kind of overcame the, the resistance and, and it was decided it was an acceptable option. The difficulty we had, aside from the fact that um, we had three weeks to design it, was the fact that we had a transfer slab at second floor level. It's kind of unusual, but 
And the reason for that, it wasn't bad design by the architect. It was simply they have very restricted, as I'm sure in every country, um, you meet um, the unit requirements, you have certain square meters, you can't go below, you can't go above, and therefore we had ended up with this sort of arrangement. So we had that, that arrangement to deal with, the transfer slab, and then we have, of course, the, the, the issues attributed to large buildings of this nature, which is the shrinkage, it's the stability, fire acoustics, of course. Um, and then we had the fact that it was a tight site. We didn't have any storage area, so we'd have to kind of build on, you know, store on the site that we were building on. Um, in terms of the um, load-bearing strategy, well, that's the arrangement of the units. So we've got these are the separating walls between the various units, you can see in dark, um, and the load-bearing structure basically follows that. So, um, you know, we use the walls that are available to us very simply. Um, however, by doing that, we end up with this situation that it comes down to the second floor um, ceiling, and we've got to trans change the direction, basically. So we've got all that load coming down to this one point, and then it, you know, it splits off into that direction. I'll try to put some thicknesses there, and you'll, you'll sense they're not particularly thick. I mean, obviously, there are some areas, but that's just because the spans are quite large. Um, but in principle, you know, they're not, they're not as thick as you might think they're going to be. And as a general rule, it's generally less than concrete. It's kind of good because you need to probably do a little bit more to add some weight in terms of acoustics and stuff. So you need a bit more dimension for that. But um, in principle, you know, if you've got a, kit, a concrete dimension, you should be able to get the timber within it if it's a, if it's a cross slam structure. Um, in order to overcome these point issues, we ended up introducing these kind of um, little steel crosses, um, which basically take the load across a, a larger area and then distribute them across a larger area, um, you know, on the panel below. A fairly obvious solution, but, you know, it's a solution on the nest. In terms of dealing with the shrinkage, um, you know, the, well, it's, it's two things. One is the shrinkage, the other thing is just the load coming down and compressing the panel. Um, and once you go quite high, you end up with quite a lot of load. And whilst the timber is good in the one direction, along its grain, it's not that good across the grain because it's like lots of straws and they just get crushed under the weight. So to overcome that, um, we just ended up, you know, dealing with the walls in kind of two ways, having part of the wall dealing with the floor loadings, the immediate floor loadings, and the other part of the wall running through, taking the loadings from above. Um, so that's the scenario. And, and by doing that, you also deal with the shrinkage to a large extent, because most of the shrinkage also happens across the, um, you know, the, from the top to bottom of the panel itself. So we're able to reduce that by 40%. Um, that's the outside walls. On the inside, we had a similar scenario where we just wanted to kind of hold up the floors, but equally wanted to let the walls run through and not, not be split by, by floors. So we came up with a, a castellated approach to, to dealing with that issue. Um, now, Whilst we thought it would work, that our, our, our main contractor didn't, so they, he, he nicely decided to film the experience. Um, so here's the panel going up, and as we don't have any space to store it, um, we're basically just installing it straight off. Now, I wouldn't be showing this if it didn't fit, <laughs> um, but I wasn't taking the film either. So um, what this says is that, you know, it, it can work. It's not that we were just kind of, you know, hoping and it just was a complete disaster. Um, you know, it does work, and it works because we're in charge of the process. So we're the people that are putting it here, we're the people that are designing it there, and we're, we're sort of managing the manufacturer. Manufacturers love that because manufacturers don't want to be designers. They just want to make manufacture material. That's what their business model is, to manufacture materials. So, in terms of overall stability, well, we just had to work with the walls that we had. Um, so still, high, you know, high, relatively high-rise building. It's a mid-rise building, but it's, you know, it's relatively high. So we're, we're needing certain elements to kind of deal with all the wind forces. Um, so, you know, we've got some that run through, whatever runs through we're using, basically. Um, and that means we have to introduce some sort of component, you know, some steel work in the corners in order to deal with these stresses. This is more interesting for the engineers, so apologies if it's boring for architects. Um, but you end up with some large bits of steel and thousands of nails, um, and then that's solved. Um, similarly, we have the opposite direction. We've got the, the lift shafts and the um, elevator shafts, I hope you understand. But, um, so elevator and the stair cores. And we're using them again, they're timbers, this isn't concrete or something. Um, and again, same principles apply, same detailing. Um, and that's an example of the, the, the lift, uh, the stair shaft. Um, and in terms of fire and acoustic separation, well, you know, we had three weeks to design this, so we weren't going to go into providing fire performance from the structure, even though we could have done it. Um, we weren't asked for that, and we had to keep our prices as competitive as possible, so, so it was all, well, if it's going to be covered up, then we're just going to assume it's covered up, and we'll, you know, we'll deal with structural stuff and not the fire and the acoustics. Consequently, the detailing is kind of rather rich, because you end up with kind of layers that are, you know, protecting the structure for fire, and then you end up with other layers that are kind of isolated for acoustics, and then you're going to puncture them, and that's why you can't use them for the fire, and therefore you end up with one behind, but, you know, all in all, it works, um, albeit you could probably do it cheaper. So there's your kind of fire performance, you know, with some of the ducting um, running in underneath. Um, and underneath. And there's a screed that's been poured in, so it's still got some wet construction involved. 
um, and that's isolated on our mineral wool um, resilient layer. Very cool stuff. And as I say, it was a tight site, so most of our storage was happening on the, on the building side. Um, there's a little time-lapse video, which I think you can get on YouTube, probably, if you type in Good Poor House or something. Um, and, you know, it basically went up as you'd expect it to, but it's kind of, um, you know, if it's useful for clients to kind of understand the speed of these things, I think, you know, a lot of the larger projects have got this, um, you know, then, you know, it's by all means look at it. Um, in terms of the cladding, as I say, it was brickwork. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just a, an English fascinating. Um, bricks are actually a very, I would say, very sustainable cladding material, and um, not because of all the energy that goes into them, but by the fact that they actually weather extremely well. Um, so, you know, you have something that is robust and, you know, that will last as long as the building structure behind, because we are expecting the timber to last 80, 100 years. Um, so this is full bricks, this is kind of four inch thick bricks, um, and they're supported of steel angle brackets, health and channels, in much the same way as supported of concrete. So, so there's no difference there, albeit, you know, obviously we've got timber behind. Shrinkage, as I say, is very low, and therefore, you know, we don't have issues with movement joints and the like. Um, balconies are actually cantilevered off in steel, um, they're not timber, there's no particular requirement to make them in timber, um, they're easier detailed this way. Um, and, and here again, the sort of um, information, again, the important thing, a 40% 40, 40 saving in terms of installation time. Now, that's not simply the, the time for us in terms of, um, you know, our, our element of the works. This is across the project. So this is actually very significant for someone who's, again, a, in terms of the, keeping the stakeholders happy in the, in the environment. Um, so, for, you know, particularly if you're building, I'd say, in a rich area where people don't like disruption, then this is a great way of building. But equally, in a very highly dense densely populated areas, again, a great way because the last thing you want is a project that everyone's complaining about and saying it's really noisy and it's going on forever. So, so this kind of addresses those things. Um, and in terms of the carbon impacts, so you've got 41 units, 4,000 square meters plus, um, you've got a lot of stored carbon in there, um, plus you never use the concrete, which kind of doubles it almost. Um, if you then just look at that and compare that to your running costs of your building, which is what we've done here, so we're saying, okay, well, how many running cost years does this represent based on the calculations we're doing for kind of energy usage? Um, and that equates to 27 years. Now, what you're trying to deliver within central London is, is a strategy, well, they've got a kind of a plan, London plan, which says we want you to deliver 20% on-site renewables. That 20% relates to your running costs. So we want you to put in PVs, we want to, you know, to whatever you're going to do, we don't care, but we just want to make sure that you're covering some of that locally. Well, this actually, at 20%, is covering five times 27 years. It's a hugely, um, you know, better than, than putting PVs on. So they didn't put any PVs on it because they didn't need to because they'd already delivered against the targets and, and, and beyond. So again, this was a sort of a benefit that just sort of came out of using the timber. And not only was it a benefit, but it actually then started introducing to the client the idea that, well, if this allows us to meet our targets as, as, a, as a region, as a, as a, a local government, um, and the government is asking us to meet these targets, and construction is representing 50% of the emissions from the country, and we've got to meet these other targets that Kyoto is setting, um, then actually we need to have a timber first policy. Um, now, Canada's actually lucky. It's got some timber first policies and one of the first countries to introduce it. But I mean, this is the reason why, because if, if you're going to address the issue, you've got to do something. And, and this is a fantastic thing to do. I don't know if BC's got it, but I certainly know other, other regions have it. Um, but, you know, so, so consequently, they've now introduced the idea of a timber first, which is perfect. And as I say, it's not simply for the carbon. It's also because in a densely populated area, you want something that's, that's acceptable for the populace, um, you know, as a, as a construction method. And just for myself, I'm not, not in a midlife crisis, this is me 40 years old, and, and um, looking at my own impact and saying, okay, well, let's just try to put it in perspective, because numbers are always, numbers are great, but, you know, unless you have a relative basis for them, it's very difficult to know whether that's good or bad. But, um, so that's my expected footprint as an 80-year-old, let's say, with, with a kilo over at 80, um, assuming I'm going to start reducing my impact year on year in line with what I'm expected to do, um, and assuming I've done what everyone else did for the last 40 years. Um, well, that equates to, in order to co just cover myself, and, and I'm ignoring everyone else for the time being, um, is I need to build 1,000 cubic metres just for myself, which, if I'm building mid-rise buildings at roughly 3 um, square metres per cubic metre, means 3,000 square metres, which, if one compares it with Bridport House, means 75% of that building just to cover me. Now, you can see how far we've got to go just to cover ourselves, let alone, um, you know, in, improve the situation. Um, you know, if, if everyone's got roughly some, something close to Bridport to deliver, just to cover themselves. So, of course, I've, I'm quite, you know, welcoming these kinds of projects because it kind of allows 
maybe we need to reach my 100% because I've got 10 people in the office. We've got quite a lot of projects to cover before we get anywhere close to, to covering ourselves. Um, and there are some, some more projects that are around. So, you know, it, it has become a little bit more accepted. Um, you know, these projects, every project helps. It sort of gets, you know, it's an acceptance question because there's an element of ignorance about, um, you know, what you can do with timber. Um, you know, we're not delivering this one, but of course we did pitch for it like everyone else. Um, we are involved in this one. We're involved as a consultant. And this is the local government saying, okay, well, if we're going to have an office, we need to have something that's representative of where we're going. And it's a completely different region. But, um, and so therefore they're coming to, you know, do something in timber. Uh, you know, it's, it's understandable. Um, it's a hybrid, so it's not simply the spans are such that we're introducing some steel. There was lots of options about concrete and all, the, all other manner of things. Um, you know, we're trying to just introduce timber where we can, you know, where, where it can make a difference. And here an eight-story mixed-use development right in the heart of London. You know, this is an interesting project because this is from a kind of a high-end developer, so one of the largest in the country, um, you know, on a, on a difficult site. Um, with quite a complicated building structure and sort of different elements doing different things, library and residential and offices. And one of their main concerns was the fact that they thought that their, their clients wouldn't want it. In other words, that, you know, once they sold the, you know, had the office space and it was all on spec, that, you know, the people that would be buying it say, I don't want to, you know, have a timber office. Um, so they went, you know, to, and asked their estate agents and said, well, you know, what do you think? Because we're not happy about this, what the architect's proposing. And they were very surprised that the answer that came back is said, we think you're going to get a premium for it. So there's just been this complete shift, because that certainly wasn't the case when we started. Um, so, but there's, there's obviously a shift happening. There are people that are actually saying, well, actually, timber is something that's valuable. It, you know, it, it's something that you pay a premium for. So that's not on site yet. I mean, it's a few years off yet. But we did do a little, um, a little a nine meter high, one to three scale model of part of the facade for, for the um, Venice Biennale, which was a nice holiday for our guys, because they normally build in the rain, and this time they were building in Venice. So, so you know, but, but you know, it's, to get something like that into kind of an, uh, an architectural fair is, is, you know, I think it's a real step forward in terms of, you know, allowing people to, to, to see timber as one of the, you know, the materials you can use. And um, unsurprisingly, when the competition came up for two towers next to Bridport House as part of that larger master plan development, um, we, with, uh, together with the architects for Bridport, um, came up with a timber tower. Um, well, you wouldn't expect us to do anything else. But, um, but it's a nice site. And, you know, this is 14 to 18 stories. Um, and yes, it's all in timber. Um, and just looking at the assessment, well, we've gone from 41 to 192 units. I mean, this would be a real step change if this one happens. Um, similar sort of offset period, um, a bit more because obviously a bit more timber when you start building at these sort of heights. Um, but, you know, we'd, we'd be a fantastic project if it happens. We've got a 50% chance, so you can cross our fingers and hope that we, hope we win it. So, to Canada. Hopefully we've got 10 minutes. Um, so what's the potential for Canada? Well, um, what I know about Canada, I mean, as I say, it's my first time on this side of um, the, the is it Atlantic, um, is Ericsson, um, because, again, because I'm an architect. Um, and that, for me, is the tradition of heavy timber in, in this part of the country. Um, but, of course, at his time, when he was building, they didn't have cross lamb, so he had just very large bits of glue lamb, which I still think is very nice. Um, but, you know, the potential for him now is to, is to you know, cover that with, with other bits of timber. Um, and you can see it in the, in the architecture of the time that, you know, people were, in a sense, designing as though they had the panels, even though they didn't. Um, you know, and it's, you can see it in the drawings, you can see it in the arrangements. You know, is it kind of a, a perfect material? You know, here's another Ericsson building. I mean, that's a cross lamb building if ever I've seen one, with these large planes of timber. You know, it was influenced by a sea ranch, I can see that as well. But, but again, that's West Coast. So I'm sort of being generalized now, West Coast. Um, and, and what I didn't know, but when I went to the local library to find out a bit more about, you know, what, what buildings there were and what one might see, um, I found this guy who um, seems relatively unknown, um, but was building in kind of for 10 years before becoming a, becoming a farmer. I think he started building again. Um, but he was building solid timber. So there's even, even history of, of, of kind of solid timber um, for these residents. And this is the text that the, of companies, this little book that you can get in the library, can't see it anywhere else. Um, which basically is essentially a solid wood box without conventional framing, three inch external, one inch internal. Now, one inch is probably a bit thin, but three inches is about right. So, you know, um, and he's in about 14 of these buildings. So, you know, there is a history already of this kind of construction, even if we don't know about it. And the great thing you have is that you've got all these publications, you've got a massive resource. Um, in the UK, we've got bugger all. Um, is, sorry, if that's a swear word, I'm probably not allowed to say it. <laughs> but, but, you know, we don't, we, we haven't had that sort of res, re, resource to, to work off. We've kind of been ad-libbing as we go, you know, and just delivering buildings and then learning from them. But, you know, you've got this kind of all made out for you. Um, 
and, and consequently, you've got people looking at these sort of you know large you know multi-story buildings. So they're fantastic. I mean, it's such an opportunity, um, you know. And I really hope these sort of things will start developing. Um, so, in summary, um, if you're going to design a bu mid-rise building of the type I'm uh, descri describing here, you've got some strategies in terms of structure. You either do the honeycomb, which is a kind of stadthouse, and um, which has a lot of walls, primarily for residential, because you don't have such large spans involved in it. Um, you have the, the Bridport scenario where you're using the kind of separating walls as your structure. It requires a bit more engineering and, um, you know, potentialize itself to be used for other uses beyond the residential. And then you have the, 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 you know, the tall tower type scenario, which is very similar to the concrete. So you're having a concrete core, you're cantilevering off that, allows you to do a lot more structurally, allows you to have much larger spans. Um, and, and you have to be realistic. Once you start building over a certain scale or a certain dimension or whatever else, you need to think hybrid. You, you know, the timber is not going not gonna to work um, just simply on its own. Um, but you really do have a choice of kind of going for the, the stick build, which is obviously the prevalent construction as a site from, from my, my short visit here and um, from the way you guys build. Um, or this, which is the way we build, um, which, you know, is principally the same in the sense you use timber, but quite different in terms of what you end up with. Um, but the thing that really bugs me about, about Canada, I think the, the real thing you need to change is this discrimination against timber. Um, because, you know, discrimination is not a good thing. It's, it's incredibly oppressive. And I, I can't quite understand what, why this four stories, or even six stories, if that's what it is. Because this is discrimination. It's discriminating against material. And, and the only reason that I can see why you discriminate against timber is because it's combustible. But then I think, well, the, the oil's combustible, but I don't see any discrimination against oil. In fact, I think, you know, the oil is allowed to do whatever it wants in this country. But, but the trees are discriminated against. And I think we need to, to kind of start talking about the millions of trees that, you know, are being discriminated against in the country. There's a lot more of them than there are people. Um, and, and I would just use the example of Australia, where you've got, you know, the first building is a, is a, is a one plus nine, you know, building. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a potential, you know, this is, you know, you're in a similar position to them in the sense that you've got no, you know, I was going to say you've got no buildings on the ground, you've actually got more buildings on the ground than they have because I've heard you've got maybe seven, ten buildings on the ground. But, you know, this is their first. And, you know, this is a, a large scale developer. So, they're, you know, they're actually, you know, they've made a conscious decision that they want to do this because they see this as the future um, for, you know, the construction in, 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 you know, in that continent or in that region. Um, it's quite a small building, actually, but, um, but it's the highest in the world now. So, so my, my plea to you is free the tree. Thank you. I have a question in regards to the glue. Can you elaborate on the uh, kind of health issues around the glue that's been used in the CLT? Um, I, I can do, yes. Um, I, w I was surprised that in the Tollwood um, document, which is quite, quite a lot of information in it, there wasn't really much mention about the fact that the majority of producers don't use formaldehyde-containing glue. Um, they're actually polyurethane, single-component polyurethane. Um, the reason why formaldehyde was, was originally used by the first producers is the fact that it's the same glue that was used within the glue lamb industry. So therefore, it's much easier for them to kind of develop the product based on that adhesive rather than a new adhesive. But, it, but they're the exception now. So as I say, it's not a... Um, that's, that's the adhesive that's used. And the other thing that I, th I think slightly misunderstood is the fact that formaldehyde is, or of course, contained within the, the tree structure. So, you know, you don't have a formaldehyde-free material. You will have formaldehyde um, from the timber. The important thing to understand is the quantity of formaldehyde is very low. It's certainly a lot less than London air. Um, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the Vancouver air is like, but, you know, that's, you've got to, you know, always say what it's relative to. So it's not an issue. All right, well, thank you very much, Liam. That was an excellent presentation.